I am a great enthusiast for complexity. I sort of see now in complexity as a, it's kind of like a, a, a critical moment for it. Um, I don't know if you've had this situation, but you know, you sit next to somebody on the plane, what do you do? Uh, I'm not going to tell you, tell me what you do. Okay, I do complexity, what's complexity? Well, and then comes a, sit, a discussion along the lines of, um, you know, ants are like traders, which are like, um, you know, traffic, kind of. Um, I, 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 saw that, I think that the moment for that is sort of gone now. Um, you know, we all write that, I mean, I'm the most not successful or successful or whatever they are, but you know, we all do that. And um, analogies are fine, but there becomes a moment when, you know, if this is meant to be a science, then it's meant to, I don't think it's just meant to do things within individual disciplines. E and even having people from different disciplines working on a specific problem in a given di discipline, say economics, um, you know, having a physicist, etc., on that. I, I don't even, I'm not really sure that that's what we want for in the long run from, that's not all we want from complexity science. Somehow it's got to show that similar mechanisms or similar models can apply in different areas different disciplines, different topics. Somehow there's a broad picture, and it's more than just an analogy. Um, I'm gonna try and go down that route. I'm not quite sure I'm gonna, um, how far it goes. I'm, I'll show you how far I've kind of got along this route. Um, so a quick kind of outline of my talk. So I said I'm very, um, you know, one of the, um, you know, Brian Arthur's L for Old Bar problem to me was an absolute, um, God send, and I, th I you know, thank him from the bottom of my heart. And um, that will influence a lot of the applications I'm actually going to talk about, together with a very, very standard model from the physics, chemistry world in terms of how groups are formed and they break up. So those two things, groups forming and break up, which kind of gives you the size of things, and the El Farol type problem, which is a kind of timing of you know, when people decide to do things or when objects decide to do things. And I'm going to run with that and see how far I get. OK, um, I, I, I'm going to try and show you that actually there's some interesting applications in really unexpected places outside of the kind of answer like traders like traffic type of, of, of kind of what you'd imagine just visually. Um, I'm going to also use that to look at, well, really, there, there are moments when networks go wrong. And um, it's a kind of time scale issue. And I think a lot of the applications that we want to do with um, complex networks, not the ones that Peter was talking about, but some of the other ones in terms of uh, particularly kind of social spreading, have, are going to run up across this problem. Um, I'm going to talk about a, um, a, um, a, in the same kind of vein as non-stationary um, observation, uh, observation of non-stationary events. I'm going to talk about a generalization of a red queen um, picture of kind of competing populations that, um, I, that seemed to be needed to explain some of the data I'm going to talk about. Eventually, I'm going to take you through um, uh, um, an argument about the um, contagion problems being, in some sense, the same. But again, I don't mean on the level of analogy. I mean on the level of data and on the level of mechanisms. Um, and then there's an application I want to talk about. And I think um, I, I chose an application hoping that no one would really talk about it. Someone slight started to talk about it, and my heart kind of stopped, and then they stopped talking about it. So. I'm glad that I can talk about it. Um, really a kind of a fascinating, you know, kind of geeky physics thing that um, is not so geeky and physics-y, but actually has a really important consequence in terms of global trading um, as um, trading speeds get down um, to the millisecond and smaller um, time scale. And then um, a kind of curious um, 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 result to, to, to leave you with a kind of a debate. Um, these models that I'm talking about here, which are really based upon that actually only two, um, um, one for sizes and one for timing, um, it turns out that the um, that the 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 the, um, the 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 extreme behaviour in them is actually more predictable than the normal behaviour, and I'll explain that when I get to it. 
Okay, here is, um, I, I should, um, to, to, so my current research is funded by actually interestingly great and a hats off to the office of naval research they funded me as a physicist under their program for human social and cultural behavior so i'm very grateful to them i think they might be regretting it because i just want to give them physics models um, but i you can see why i want to do that when you look at this i, I one of my um, favorite um, covers from new york times was um, where, um, as a result of um, a lot of um, very clever um, thought processes, identifying social issues that gave rise to um, insurgency and terrorist groups, etc., etc. In the end, it turns out that everything's connected to everything, and everything's on the same page. And you won't be able to read this, I'll just read it out to you. Um, so it's meant to portray the complexity of the American strategy in Afghanistan. I'm certainly not having a go at the strategy, thank you, you know, at least they wrote it down. Um, show me another nation that wrote it down. They, they wrote it down. Um, so when we understand, so this was General um, um, Stanley McChrystal, when we understand that slide, we'll have won the war. So, um, you know, a little, a little bit of backstory about that? It, so, you know, this, this is only half the story because this yes, is I know. Story. Yes, yeah, it was only got a PowerPoint. You actually use a model. Yes, yes. So this is just the front end of it. Yes, <laughs> yes. So um, I, um, I, th I think they um, were interested to see other types of approaches. So um, my personal view to this is that in the end, whenever you look at data from a conflict you're told something about something happening, uh, you know, a number of people killed, um, rings here, this is Colombia, South America, um, the rings here are proportional to the number that are killed on a certain day, you're just cycling through days, um, red is for um, killings and injuries total, and then the green, it's called color-coded by different guerrilla groups doing the killing, um, it's all in certain in, um, civilians being killed. Um, but here, the, you know, the, the data takes the form of um, you know, what happened, when did it happen, where did it happen, um, and then, of course, there's an endless debate about why it happened, and that's the what bit that I'm not going to talk about, except that an answer sort of comes out of the, the results. Um, and from now on, I should say, of course, you know, this is a very unpleasant subject to, to talk about, the civilian deaths, etc. But in the end, um, it, it's another one of these cases like studying um, um, HIV, and it's one of the numbers that Peter had on his um, charts. So I just uh, run back in history. Um, um, about 2003, we got hold of data for um, the start of the Iraq war. Um, 2004, we were analyzing, of course it's going on, every day data were coming in. This is a histogram of the number of events where a certain number of people, X, are killed. So there are of course um, lots of events where very few people are killed, and there are very few events where lots of people are killed. That makes sense, but what doesn't necessarily, what you wouldn't have expected is that it would line up on such, I mean, you know, human, human um, conflict is, you know, quote unquote, one of the messiest um, of all human activities, and yet um, there's a pretty good, you know, as what the way things work in um, empirical data, as you all know, and um, that's a pretty good um, straight line. You can pass it through the Clausen Newman. Um, Shalizi um, machinery, maximum likelihood, um, Kamogorov Smirnov testing, etc. It, it, you can't reject the power law. And it turns out that the slope has a value of 2.3. And so we sat there looking, it wasn't that, that the answer is 42, the answer is now 2.3. What, what on earth does that mean? So, of course, you need another um, um, a conflict to compare that with. We, um, again, um, um, this is a collaboration with a social science group. Um, they spent eight years, seven years, getting data, trawling through NGO data sets, uh, media data sets. It's, oh, media data, it's not data sets, just trawling through the, the, the news and the reports and military reports and kind of tallying it all up. And um, so we did exactly the same exercise for Colombia. And again, it falls on this um, straight line. It's not just a straight line, it's a straight line on a log log plot which means if it's a power law, you again go through this proper statistical testing, don't just draw a straight line on log log. Um, and um, it, you can't reject the power law, and um, the slope comes out at about 2.9.
So, um, for us, this was kind of curious. We didn't know what to do with it, so we, um, we just put it on the web, as you do with things you don't really know what to do with. Um, so we put it on the web, and, um, and, and there was a lot of um, attention. It drew a lot of attention, a lot of criticism, of course, as well, but, uh, of all sorts. But um, a lot of attention in the sense that people say, well, you know, what's going to happen then? What's, you know, why is it that number? And what's going to happen? What happens with other wars? And what's going to happen in the long run? What, 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 what? So um, in the intermediate time up until this was published a couple of years ago, um, we spent a lot of time going through data from a lot of other wars. And the result is that, um, just to kind of bring it, um, to give the bottom line for the result, if you look at conventional wars, um, you can reject, uh, we looked at a number of conventional wars for, you know, we can look at the, what the data we had later, I can tell you about that. But, you know, World War, um, World War II, World War I, American Civil War, Spanish Civil War, these kind of wars where there are kind of, um, you know, it's almost like the troops are lining up um, and fighting each other in mass, uh, almost like a mass action, almost like a chemical reaction, like the Lanchester. Um, equations that um, Rob took and mentioned yesterday, differential equations. Um, what, you, um, what you get out from those conventional um, wars is that you can reject a power law. So it's not even that those wars um, have a power law and they have a value and it sits on this graph. They're off somewhere else in some other part of uh, distribution space. But for all of these other wars, and I have, you have to take it on faith, we didn't have any data other than this. I have actually got data from Malaysia, but I haven't got to have the time to look, look through that. We had Indonesia, we had all these others. Um, for all the others that we had, you couldn't reject the power law. They looked like these two, and they all seem to sit around, and it's debatable whether you think they sit around, but they do seem to sit around a value around 2.5. And interesting, Aaron Closet, um a year before had done, uh, published a result for global terrorism where he looked at global terrorism database, nothing to do with these databases, might have some overlapping points, but common points, but basically it's just terrorist attacks, and that sits exactly on 2.5. So there's a kind of curious thing, here is the results, there's a number, this is human conflict, none of these countries really have anything to do with each other, you know, there's Northern Ireland here. Um, Colombia, near Colombia, Iraq, etc., etc., and it sits around 2.5. And the question is, why? You know, what kind of model can you build that would be, that is sort of meaningful that would reproduce the number 2.5? Not, you know, so it's quite quite hard. Um, there's something else I should mention actually, and we tracked as we tracked the Iraq and Colombia because they're the two that are going on um, were going on at that time. And now you can do the same with Afghanistan. Um, but at the time we were doing Iraq and Colombia. Interesting, they seem to be heading towards 2.5. So it's not even that you know, they just sit static, it's like they're degenerating in some way towards 2.5. So here's a model. Now, the reason, uh, before I, uh, um, I explain this, so that you've got, um, one thing to um, um, appreciate is that the, I was told that the, that the standard model is a very hierarchical model of what an opponent would be in an insurgent war. So that's very much like a kind of projection, it tends to be, a, you know, we could have a long discussion about this, I'm not an expert in that sense. I mean, I know what a hierarchy is, but I don't know the, the whole history of, of, of military modeling, but I was told that, um, that the insurgent force, you should, in some sense, there's a head and then there's another leader and etc., 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 etc. And then there are networks, and people have, we've all seen those networks, Krebs network, everybody's got a, you know, the network, the terrorist network, and who's connected to who. And I don't think that any, you know, from what I've to my knowledge, none of those are able to reproduce this result of why would the casualties follow a 2.5 power law? My take on it is that actually operationally, when it comes down to it, the guys on the ground or the whoever's on the ground doing the operational side, what's happening is they're doing it in the same way. In other words, there's some kind of, it's the way people, if they're in some kind of David and Goliath, some kind of insurgent position, against some much stronger force, how they'd, how they'd actually form themselves and fight. And it doesn't really matter whether you're up the mountains in the Andes or out in the desert in Iraq, 
you do it in that way. You've sort of been forced into that. Um, how can I back that up with some kind of model? I promised some kind of model, uh, that, that, that um, simple, generic, minimal model. Here it is. It's based on a polymer model. It's based on actually any kind of reaction model you can think of where you're forming clusters. People even have models of this for proteins, similar models for proteins in Parkinson's, etc. So think about amyloid um, um, formation. Um, but it's got one difference, and let me explain it. So let's imagine that the insurgent force has some strength, N. And here I've got, um, you know, if you added up all these dark um, faces here, that will be the um, total strength. I mean, it might be, I'm not sure what it is here, but something like 13 or something like this. Um, this is the, um, so that they've got some kind of strength. And at any one moment, they're broken up into pieces. And those pieces, over time, are going to reform and then break up. Now, why would they reform? Well, in the end, if you're in an insurgency, you're trying to fight something, you want to put your pieces together to be as strong as you can. And if you're allowed to, if, you know, if the other side will leave you alone, you will. But every so often, the other side come around, the state military, they come around, or there's some kind of your fear of detection. And just like in the animal world, or just like in so many other, and, and, you know, fish, etc., etc., we've all seen those sharks going in and the, and the fish just fly in all directions. Um, the, the, the cell will fragment. So we're just gonna have a model where, over time, Groups form, they grow, they gradually, or they just combine. So it's like I can imagine an urn model where I'm picking out these blocks of different sizes, putting them together, and then every so often they fragment into individual pieces, and I carry on the process. It's almost like building up sand piles and, and then dropping them again, and then fragmenting them again, except there's nothing spatial in here, and that's an absolute key feature. So the key feature of this, of this model is that there is no space in there. Why would that make sense? Well. There is occasional long-range communication. And when I talk about groups combining, I don't mean they're actually standing next to each other. I just mean they're coordinating their action in some way. So these cells are um, gradually forming over time and then breaking apart. Um, it's easy to write down a differential equation for that. Um, this is the form of it. It says that the rate of change of the number of cells of size s, here there's a cell of size s equals 2, is the whole, um, is, the, the, is the number, it's like a master equation, just a, a, a rate equation. It's the rate at which I form them by, you know, let's take a group, a cell of size, say, six. I can form that by adding, a, by combining a four and a two, or a five and a one, or a three and a three. So this adds together all those possible partitions. Then, with a certain fr um, fragmentation probability, they scatter. It scatters into individual objects. Arizona. And then this is the um, term where I lose groups of size 6 because a group of size 6 is combined with a group of size 3 when I'm pulling them out of the urn and it's made a group of size 9. So that's the equation. It's very simple. It's very much like a kind of polymer model. You can solve it exactly. You solve it exactly, it gives the answer 2.5. Now, um, it's not that this is parameter tuned, you try and fiddle around with these parameters, there are a number of papers with, with, where people are desperately trying to get a result that isn't 2.5. And it's like a fixed point of this system. And it's due to the fact that if you were to think of a power law slope, a little bit like a, a sand pile, when you break up one of those large but very infrequent groups down here, they all drop back to the beginning. And then they start building up again. If you were to fragment randomly groups, you know, a group of size six would break into a three and a three, then you're putting them back in the middle and you tend towards a normal distribution. So this complete fragmentation is an important part of this process. It is what gives this power of 2.5. And I believe it sort of makes sense for an insurgency. I mean, why, if you're in a group of 10 insurgents, why would you suddenly say, you know, well, goodbye to five of them and you go off with two fives? You, you're, unless you're in sensing danger, you're going to stay as a 10. So um, we've um, gone through um, many um, kind of generalizations. This is very interesting that you can do all sorts of things to try and change the 2.5 or try and manipulate it or try and explore how, where, how you can break, you know, if you were to target, it's a bit like what Peter was saying, would you target big groups, would you target small groups? 
how would you disrupt this? This gives you a wonderful kind of toy. Um, you can also play a game of how long wars will last. I mean, if I know that I've got this, this size and I'm playing a kind of attrition war, um, as they're combining and breaking up, I'll just remove them every so often because they, you know, they get, they're, they're killed. And if you do that, again, I won't go through the details as a reference here. Um, if you look at the, as a function of the asymmetry, there's something really interesting happens. The longest wars tend to be the ones with the, this is all purely the model, the, um, the, 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 the solid line is the model. Um, the longest wars are the ones with the very small minority of insurgents. And the reason is, to, it's a little bit like Peter's, what Peter was saying. You, you may be able to kind of combat it when you find it, but you've got to find it. So the trouble is, when there's a very small force, it takes a lot, it, it, it's going to take you time, it takes time in the model to find these small, these small groups. Then when you find them, you can destroy them, but you can't find them. So it's really not hard to wipe them out. So we took data from, um, from the um, conventional wars, and those are the um, um, blue circles, and from insurgent wars, and, and you know, that isn't a good fit but at least it sort of has the right trend. I know, um, you know we submitted this in 2007, so, um, you know, with the Iraq, um, and I, and so the Iraq war lasted longer than 2007, and the Afghanistan war is still going on, so uh, hard, those points should be higher. Okay, um, in terms of the timing of the attacks, so the size of the attacks is a kind of building block model, coalescence and fragmentation, fission, fusion and fission. They come in the literature in those, with those words. The timing of attacks, we found it's bursty, so it's not a Poisson process, but it's non-Poissonian in exactly the same way as the El Farol problem is. So if you look at the time series of peaks in the El Farol problem, it has the same burstiness. Now, why would that be? Well, you know, what are they competing for? They're not going to a bar. What are they doing? So here's a story. And this is the wonderful thing. Once you've got a, you know, as we all know, we've got a model that kind of fits with the data. Like, right, I'm, I've now got to just change the words somehow. And there's a, that, that, that becomes an interesting process because then you've got to think of the words. Here's a set of words. I don't know they're right, but they're sort of at least plausible. So if I have a, if I'm an, in, which I'm not, an insurgent in a group, and I have a small amount of, of resources, I don't really want to use those on a day that um, another group's going to use, even though they're on my side in some sense. I don't want to, you know, I want to get in the news. You know, they, as the quote from um, 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 Kilcullen, the advisor to, um, to Bush, said, you know, they're not blowing up Humvees because they just want to reduce the population of Humvees. They're doing it because it makes news. So you want to use your resource on a day where very few others are so that you make it to the headlines. Exactly the same then as the old feral problem. You get... I'm not going to show the, 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 the details, but you get exactly the same burstiness then as in the real data. So that's kind of interesting. Fine if, you were, if I was a conflict scientist and this was a conflict conference, it stopped and that would be it. But you know, is there any generality to, 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 to these results? Um, so you know, the results are there's common patterns in, I haven't gone through the stuff to do with gangs and guilds. As soon as you're talking about groups that only break up when they sense danger and they break up completely. You're talking about a whole swathe of illicit groups from you know, cyber guilds through to gangs, etc. And we've done studies on, on these. Um, like I said, I think that it shows that there's a kind of common way in which just humans do terrorism, irrespective of their hierarchy. You know, irrespective of who's the president, the vice president and of, of the insurgent group. I, the, it's a, just putting it in everyday language. But the, um, the way it's done on the ground is common. And that is, a, it's, I still don't think that, um, I don't think O&R, um, I'm not sure what they think of that. Um, but what about other disciplines? That's really what I want to get to here. What, what you know, is there something else that, that might, I mean, now with, if that's how humans do that, what about other things that humans do? Is there anything, you know, what other fields can this, um, this connect to? It's a very simple model. Can I understand other stuff in a similar way? 
Well, um, so Gene Stanley had this really nice result. Uh, you can kind of argue about what exactly should be carrying on out in the tail here. But in terms of trading size on um, three different um, stock, um, stock markets, where again the slope is around 2.5. And again, then there's a natural story. Well, you know, groups of traders, there's no spatial arrangement because they're all on the phone or in some chat room. They're forming groups, they come to some opinion, then they leave the group and they go off and trade. They trade in the same way. So the size distribution of the groups is reflected in the trade, the probability distribution of trade size. Let's go to something else. What about neur neurons firing? Well, there's a, it turns out that there's a well-known result from neurons firing um, in terms of neur neuronal avalanches, the so-called three halves law. Um, this was from um, um, Dante Chiavo's um, paper in Nature Review. I mean, look at that if you're interested. But there's a, a, a pretty beautiful um, um, three halves power law slope. There are mechanisms out for this. I'm just trying to interpret as many of these results as I can using a one model. It's like MacGyver with the penknife. Um, so, um, if you think of, um, of, of, of neurons as some collection, and they form groups that are not necessarily spatial, and they kind of, but the, the, the groups are in terms of a kind of synchronization, some kind of synchronized activity, and then every so often that breaks down. And the way it's going to break down is now I'm not just going to pick a group, I'm going to pick one object out of the group, so the higher the number of objects in the group, the larger the probability it will be picked, so I just multiply the s to the minus alpha, which would be the s to the minus 2.5 by an s, and I get a factor of therefore s to the minus 3, um, s to the minus um, 3 halves, rather than 5 halves. But it's the same mechanism, it's the same 5 halves law. Um, to go to something which you think would be completely ridiculous, um, connection. Um, so there was an interesting paper out in Nature um, last year. Again, this is just an exercise in running with one model. It's not to say that it's, it's just running with one model. How far can you go? Um, so there's an interesting paper out in Nature, um, um, 2010, superconductivity. Um, so the superconducting temperature was enhanced by um, interstitial, pockets of interstitials. So for those who are not um, really into the physics, not really interested, imagine is that so superconductivity is meant to be some kind of coherent collective effect. And it's sort of strange that you'd have kind of defects in there, kind of irregularities in there that happen to follow a power law and that raise the superconducting temperature. I mean, it's so hard to raise the superconducting temperature. So there's something special about the arrangements of pockets in a power law of 2.5 that raises the temp that raises the temperature, <coughs> and so the in inference from um, or if you just think of applying our model, maybe it's that when you've got a coherent um, superconducting state and it's just on the point of starting to go to break down, it's co coherence is beginning to break down. It's trying to form its coherence across the whole system, and then there's a decohering event, like a phone on or something like this. Bang, off it goes. It just breaks apart all those Cooper pairs in that, in that pocket. Then you've got exactly the same <coughs> process as we were talking about in that model, and you we would be, you'd, you'd um, predict that there'd be a 2.5 slope to the um, size of the interstitial pockets, and that's what there is. Okay. So um, I'm going to come back to the, the well. The networks I've sort of slight, I've indirectly talked about because those insurgents I didn't have them in a network. I didn't have them in one of the scale-free network. I didn't have them in any kind of network. They were forming groups and breaking apart. Now, if I'd have drawn the network, so they would have been um, completely connected, fully connected, and then they break apart and form connections with others. So I could always interpret as a dynamical network. But it's not a static network. You can't, I don't think you can explain the data using a static network. I want to go on and talk about uh, uh, um, something else that I learned through then um, the escalation of events. I talk about the timing events in terms of uh, the alpha old problem. I want to talk about the escalation of events. If you look at, in any, pr take a province in Afghanistan. We all hear about Kandahar, Helmand, um, Kunal, whatever. Um, if, you know, there was nothing happening back in 2002, and then things began to pick up, and they 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 pick up. 
So let's just take the following view. Let's take the view that it is really like a red queen race. Let's look at the, you know, kind of everyone talks about the arms race, etc. Where would we get? Well, we get that the red queen or the insurgents, let's call it a blue king. So they're against the blue king. Now, the red queen, the insurgents, if they carry out an, 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 a successful attack, then they'll probably learn something from it, or at least they'll, they'll gather, they'll, they'll, they'll get better at doing something, or maybe they'll attract more people, they'll attract more insurgents, because they're now successful. Of course, the other side, the Blue King, are trying to adapt as well. So, um, if they were neck and neck, you'd think there wouldn't be any, um, well, you know, how would the insurgents carry out any successful attacks? So maybe it's that the Red Queen actually pulls ahead. So maybe we, we need to kind of generalize the picture of the Red Queen hypothesis, whereby it's not the Red Queen running on the spot. The Red Queen runs on the spot, but every so often, like in any regular race, you'd see her kind of pull, a, pull ahead. And then the Blue Queen, the other, the opponent would gradually pull ahead as well and pull back and then she'd pull ahead. Let's, let's take that as the image. Can we explain then the date of the escalation? escalation? Turns out you can. Because what happens is the following. Here are, let's just say, these are the successful days for the insurgents. This is when they kill a coalition military, at least one. And I'm going to plot out those times between those events, those fatal events for the coalition military. So um, over time, the time interval goes down. Of course, it's messy, it's noisy, but that's because, that's because of this race. You know, the Red Queen's gradually getting better. Uh, for whatever reason, more people, more manpower, whatever you want to say it. Um, but it, it's a kind of noisy process. It turns out that it, it reasonably well follows, if this isn't the power law distribution, this is a, um, what, what is known in psychology or manufacturing as a progress curve. So if you, if you do something, like you make, make, make something, make a car, the first car you take will take forever, and the second car will take half of forever, and then by the time you got to about the tenth car, you're probably doing it in about you know six months, and then three months, and then two months, and then one. So this is actually a very well-known um, distribution. I'm, I'm sorry, well-known um, um, trend for human activity of doing something. So we did that. We looked at these these behaviours for each of the different provinces in Afghanistan. And um, what I'm going to show you on the curve below is the following two parameters. Tau 1 is the time between the first two fatal events. So it's the first, first coalition military was killed here, and the second coalition military was killed here. And that time is Tau 1. B is the, it's not an escalation rate, but it, it, it tells you how quickly the Taus decrease. We're now going to plot B as a function of Tau 1. Now, before we um, talk about this, you can obviously see a straight line there. Um, there was a lot of discussion about contagion effects, about um, you know, the Pashtuns in this province, the whatever's in the border with Pakistan. There were uh, you know, a lot of discussion about what might be the major influences in different provinces. All we did was plot this very simple curve and then plot these two parameters against each other, and you see all of the, um, all of the um, provinces where there's some violence, there are some provinces with no violence. I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But there are all the provinces where there's some violence, um, they fit on a curve, a straight line, actually, because this is a log, um, a log linear plot. Not only that, but when you look at the timing between global terrorism events, that also sits on the curve. And so do suicide bombings, Hezbollah and Pakistan, and the suicide bombings in Pakistan. There are a lot of different, in fact, all of the sets of data, you look at Iraq, same thing happens. So something's going on here as well. What is it? Well, it's not geographical. So I, I've had many explanations said to me, it's the snow line, it's the, you know, it's the distance to the border, it's, it's the, I've had, uh, you know, we've had people write to us from different um, marine units saying their marine unit was better than another unit, and, you know, all of these kind of things. But what you can see here, whatever the explanation is, it's kind of a complicated one. Because if I take Farah, Kunar, and Kandahar, um, Kunar's up here, Farah's over here, and Kandahar's right down in the south. So whatever we think about them being different, um, operationally, they're, they're the same for some reason. 
If I looked at the time series for the escalation for those three, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So our explanation for this, here we go back to this agile red queen. Instead of the evolution of the, of the war in individual provinces being like the red, the insurgents are running and the military are running at the same time. It's not that, it's that the insurgents pull ahead and then they pull back and then the, the blue the blue king pulls back and then the red queen goes ahead. So the relative distance between the two is kind of one step forward, two steps back. And that, of course, you know, for, for all of us, that's a, that, that sounds a bit like a random walk. Well, actually, if you take the result for a random walk, the rate since the size of a random walk grows precisely as the number of steps to the power of 0.5. Um, that's what the size grows as, and it's, I think, well, the size of the lead is proportional to the rate at which the insurgents can carry out the attacks. So it's inversely proportional to the time period between. So surely then I should get the number of steps to the minus power of minus 0.5. And what you can see here is that at least these data seem somewhat centered around the 0.5. And the nice thing is, now, if you really were into polymer physics and random walks and self-avoiding random walks and different dimensionalities of walks and et cetera, et cetera, you can interpret all of these in terms of their different numbers, their different B values, um, in terms of a kind of random walk in sort of advantage space, the relative distance in advantage between the, the red queen and the blue king. So. Um, So it doesn't come much easier than the random walk. That's, um, and, um, so that, that was kind of nice to see. Let me take the model then of the break of the, let's go back to the model of the, the cells forming and breaking apart. Let's look at that for one second. Um, I, I mentioned something about networks. I'm sorry this is um, small. Um, I'm going to take those, uh, let's imagine we've got that group, and they're not insurgents now, they're just any social group. They, it could be insurgents, but um, we've got, I've got a group of size, say, uh, four, a group of size three, a couple of groups of size two, and a few groups of size one. All these kind of pieces, like Lego pieces, uh, you know, kids half done a Lego toy. And I'm going to represent that uh, um, in this way. It's going to be, a re uh, this is the representation of the different groups at a particular time t. So I've got three groups of size one, three groups of size two, one group of size three, one group of size four. And you could do this with Lego. And now I'm going to do this process of forming them together and occasionally fragmenting them. And I'm going to look at the disease, some kind of um, propagation of a rumor or a disease or a meme through this, through this system. Turns out you get nothing like you would get for any kind of average. We've tried all sorts of time average of this network. I mean, these are networks that are changing, like Peter had, networks changing in time. So these networks are changing in time. They're changing, the, and they're not just changing one link or two links. They're dramatically changing. When, when, they, when you lose a cluster, when you lose a cluster, it bursts all its links. So this isn't just like a simple rewiring problem. Um, it turns out that the propagation of, the, of, of stuff on, or some process on this um, dynamically changing network, where the network is changing on the same scale that the actual process is diffusing. Um, gives you very different behaviors, the very different features from the usual profile. I'm going to show you here um, a couple of, just a couple of pieces of, of, of um, empirical data and, and the output from the model. First of all, look at the red here. This is the typical output from the model. You get these multiple peaks, and it's a really slow decay process. If I did this using mass action with some, or some SIR, I'm sorry, on some time aggregated network, or I did it with mass action, it would be a huge peak here, and then it would quickly die off, because everything's connected to everything for mass action. And for the average, for the um, aggregated network, well, they're all kind of connected as well over time. But what you get is if you have this bursty kind of behavior in terms of groups forming and then breaking up, is you, that, that kicks off peaks. And I'm not going to show, I, I haven't got, you know, I, I should go through um, 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 statistical tests for distances between distributions, etc., um, between functions. I'm just going to show you some pictures. So it's kind of interesting that if you look at tweet data, and this isn't just kind of the number of, of sites of Gaddafi during the, the, the weeks of, um, you know, the most intense, um, this was around, and this was March. This is the UN's social activity data where they try to distinguish each particular event, each particular social event. 
So, um, and it's to do with the uprising. And there is this kind of multiple peak bursty kind of structure. And if it was all by cell phone, then it's sort of con it's consistent with this kind of spatially independent type of model where people come on the streets, forces will come out, they break apart, they disappear off, then they form again. And they form also with, you know, um, coherently by um, using um, cell communications. If I also show kind of code red worm um, behavior, that, that, that has a similar kind of burstiness. That you, it's just really hard to get resurgent peaks from any type of typical um, 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 es, um, epidemiological model. I put down here something I found, I didn't realize that, but it's a big deal, the, the cyber attacks for Singapore, I didn't quite realize that. Anyway, um, I just show here three particular examples where actually the, the top two, I mean, who, who okay, um, empirical data, who's to say that this, this is robust? We then have, so we, we, we took out two examples, these are YouTube downloads, this is that model I just showed you with one set of condition, one set of values for the coalescence of fragmentation. And for these three different situations, this of downloading YouTubes, this of Japanese yen um, exchange rates, this of colds in, for kids in schools, we'd have this project going on looking at colds of kids in schools, you get this same, um, or you get the different um, behaviors, but they're all similar to the model just by changing the time scales of the model. So these three problems become quote unquote the same just by changing the time scales. Um, the effect of time, so somebody yesterday showed the minimal spanning tree for clustering, I just want to show you that. What this looks like when you actually look at the, 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 the actual behavior of, of, of correlations breaking apart and forming, it also um, follows this, um, this kind of, this kind of um, formation. These, every one of these is an exchange rate, an FX exchange rate, and the, it's a minimal spanning tree and the distances between them are the correlations. But you can see what happens over time. This is the minute-by-minute minute scale. This is what the FX market looks like. This is the global FX market on a minute-by-minute minute scale. And you see this thing is bursting apart and breaking apart and forming and reforming um, all the time. So the um, HSBC Bank has this on some of their traders. Um, I think they just use it as a screensaver. They, they're meant to be looking at it, but... Um, <laughs> Okay, um, let me go on to the, um, um, what, what do I think is going to, okay, so I, 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 I've tried to motivate kind of getting back, getting complexity back to looking across different areas and in, in you know, places that you wouldn't think of to look at similar models and just changing the narrative, you can sort of give a plausible story. At least you put up a model and you say, well, somebody come along with a better one. And um, that's quite, I think that's quite a powerful way to proceed. Because um, a lot of people criticize models, but then when you say to them, well, show me one that also is consistent with the statistics, um, they're, they're slower to produce something. Um, here's something that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. Um, future financial crises. Um, but, um, you know, being a physicist, getting in the speed of light is quite a good thing. Um, so um, something kind of interesting is going to be happening, I think. Um, not me, just think, so a lot of people are, are now thinking or scared about, um, when complexity gets down beyond human response times. So, you know, people worry about this with fighter jet pilots, they worry about it with, you know, people falling asleep at power plant desks. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about people who are awake, who are not flying fighter jets, but are actually um, um, trading the trillions of dollars that we were hearing about. Um, Singapore, I took an example of Singapore, this is not within the sub-seconds of range, but it's sort of near it. This was from a few months ago, um, if you notice between 5, 19, 51, so it's just, you know, 19 minutes past 5, 51 seconds, and um, 10 seconds later. Um, you see there's this huge drop, a kind of drop that would um, you know, not happen in a, in a week, happened, and this is just one happened in a couple of seconds. Could you, of course, if you were looking over the whole day, well, it might recover again. Maybe it recovers again, so you'd never notice it. You start looking at point probability distributions, you'd never see it on the one day returns. But something's happening in terms of the complexity right down at that scale. What is it? Well, you know, as I said, it's not just me, it's, and many people worried about it. Um, 
people are worried about it, particularly the regulators, because they don't really know what to do. And people, somebody was talking about this yesterday. You know, what do you do? You just kind of pull the plug on fast trades, or you tax people so they can't trade quickly. Well, that, that, that's going to cause all sorts of other effects. Well, let's see if we can kind of understand those large jumps. So um, I'm going to take you to, a, we're going to go to a part of the finance world where, you know, not many, not many people have looked. And um, this is a particular stock, and it's dropping here, and it looks like a large change. That's not the change I'm really interested in. This is on the minute scale, minutes through here. This is the thing I'm interested in, this thing that nosedives and then comes back up. It's doing this on the scale of, this is 100 milliseconds. On the scale of 100 milliseconds, this thing drops to the floor and then recovers. And this is happening all the time. And this is what I'm going to look at. I'm going to use data from Nanex, who are the company in Boston that um, have been collecting this for a number of, 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 of years. Just to give you a sense of why 100 seconds and 10 seconds matter, and probably, and, you know, it's going to matter for Singapore at some stage. So they're already building, um, you know, dedicated, they've been doing this for years, um, dedicated fiber optic cables just for trading. But, you know, it's now getting down to the stage where, um, you know, it's, it's sort of getting down to the speed of light. On here, I'm red, you know, do a bit of, bit of physics here. Um, this is how long it takes for light to do a round trip from London to New York. This is New York to Singapore, and this is Singapore to London. So you can see that, um, of course, it takes longer to go through London, but, you know, when you're looking about 0.1 seconds for light, you know, nothing goes drive faster than speed of light, despite what you hear about neutrinos, that's, you know, uh, nothing goes faster than speed, speed of light. Um, it's going to take 0.1 seconds for somebody to, to either, you know, you can imagine, they see something from New York and they send a trade. So the information came from New York, oh my God, that's happening, I'm going to buy. That's going to take 0.1 seconds. So that crash I just told you about, that's happening inside that time. In fact, you could sit in New York with uh, my laptop here, even though my trusty laptop, which isn't so trusty, um, 3 gigahertz switch, um, 3 gigahertz clock inside, that's 0.33 nanoseconds. If, if I had every cycle of the clock was a decision to buy or sell, um, I could do 100 million operations by the time your trade had gone from Singapore to New York or back. So, you know, I sit next to Wall Street in my little laptop, with, and, and I could do 100 million transactions. So, um, uh, basically, the, the question is, can the financial world, can the financial centers cope with this? It's, funny, it's a funny thing, you know, it's the financial world's global and everything. No, I think it's, it's becoming local. You know, if you sit in a, with a laptop in a Starbucks next to Wall Street, you're going to be quicker than the, than the entire, um, you're gonna, you can do stuff within, the, you can arbitrage against the entire Singapore stock market. Not good news for the Singapore stock market. Um, I want to show you how these, let's, so let's look at these big spikes. You know, they look like spikes, but if you was to stretch them out in nanosec um, millisecond space, they look like dives and then recoveries. So here's an interesting thing, the number of them over time. So you think that you might be, it's like, who cares about nanoseconds and milliseconds? They all kind of disappear when I'm worrying about days and my pension and things. Well, here's the deal, that the standard and pause, took an, when it took a nosedive around 2008, um, the occurrence of these spikes actually zipped up. Now, I've got no idea, you know, this is just data that we've, you know, Nanex didn't even look at this. We just, this is the first thing we did and couldn't quite believe it. Um, so, we, you know, did this, did the standard and pause, the daily standard and pause, kick off these kind of mini fractures? Or was it the other way around? Or are they just totally kind of intertwined? Let's, let's think, have I got another five minutes? Yeah, five minutes, right, okay, yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting when you look at kind of human response time. So, you know, most of us can do stuff, you know, if it's about afternoon time, we can break our cars, you know, put the brake on your car uh, around in about, you know, a second, maybe like slightly less than a second. In my Florida driving test, I think it, I remember answering that question and it was about 750 milliseconds or something. Anyway, um, um, 500 seconds is the time for the response to get to the sensory, you know, without any kind of motor response. Um, 600 milliseconds is the time for a, grand, a chess grandmaster to determine whether it's in checkmate or not. So I'm telling you all these scales, so this is like a trader there watching something happen. And, you know, can he respond? Of course, the answer is no. 
first of all, you can't be holding a cup of tea or coffee or anything and go over it. But you know, even if you had to sit there on the hand on the button, can't can't respond to this. So this world is operating. This whole kind of fractured, um, computer-driven world is operating down in this hundred millisecond scale, and it's seventy percent of the um, trades in the um, in the U.S. So seventy percent of the market is controlled down in the nanosecond, in the millisecond scale. So we looked at the data and we found something kind of interesting. Um, we found that there's a kind of phase transition, uh, for physics, like phase transitions. Um, but the, um, it's a kind of interesting phase transition. It's a transition between behavior, just to explain what's going on here. This is a behavior above 100 milliseconds. If I look at the size of events, they follow a power law. This is just the p-value, significance value, and this is the alpha value of the power law. As soon as you go down towards the limits of human um, response times, that power law becomes really bad. In other words, it's just not a power law. And the alpha value of the jet becomes irrelevant because it's not a power law. Um, the spikes, it's less so. I think the story is here that what's happening is crashes. But the, the humans are trying to get in. Every time they see it dip, they do try to get in. So they mess it up. And the spikes, they couldn't care less. They're happy. So something's going on here. The question is, can we explain then the two differences between these two sides? And this is where the alpha or bar problem comes in. Because, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time trying to catch up with what I know, never did, but uh, catch up with the, the wonderful work that Brian and John have done with their stock market. But one, you know, I got into the physics world where they were, we were all trying to do it with binary representations like spins, which is a great model. It's a great model to look at. Um, but the key was, can you reproduce the stylized facts, the statistical facts? Can you reproduce the cluster volume, all, all the things that Brian um, was talking about? And um, the answer is yes, but um, who's going to believe that your real people operate using ones and zeros and strategies that kind of respond um, up, down, buy, sell in such a discrete way? Well, they wouldn't believe it for humans, but I think you could believe it for machines. If I'm dealing with machine algorithms, and these are algo traits, and they can't be run in, you know, they can't be run in, it can't run for five seconds, it's got to run for 100 milliseconds. You're going to have very simple responses. And what we found is when we try to fit those crashes down in the sub-second range, where 70% of all the trades are, it's this model, it's the El Farol model that gives the representation. In fact, it's the binary representation of the El Farol model which gives the, the, the fit to the data. I'm not saying it is then for the model, but it's really interesting. It's kind of like, so as much as you, you need, I think you need a kind of analog version for the human regime, and I, 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 you sort of need, it goes to the binary version when you're down in the machines, machine land. So what we find is that the, um, 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 the, um, you can explain then the distribution and the, 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 the high likelihood of crashes and spikes down in this sub-second regime purely by this crowding in strategy space. When I've got very few bits that are being looked at, then there's a, there are very few responses, very few bit strings that I can actually write down that look like strategies. And so you get a crowding of all the algorithms. You know, It doesn't matter what they're all called. They might tend to do the same thing because they're just buy-sell when they see a sell-buy type of situation. So um, you can reproduce these kind of very bursty um, um, jumps and spikes down in this regime where they do not appear up in the, in the regime where you allow the, the bit strings to be longer. I'm going to have to go through all that. And just to take you through the, um, the, I think I'll do the final slide, because we can get an agreement with what's going on in this sub-second world of trading, we can now go in and start to look at it. And we can take a look at the anatomy of a crash. And here I've just got the price series from that binary model. This is a De Bruyne graph. I've got time to go through it all, but um, these are the kind of transitions that are happening in the De Bruyne graph. So up to here, if I'm looking at this as a price series and I'm doing my usual kind of economic analysis time series, I couldn't really tell what's happening. I'm going to get to what's going on down here below. I'm going to stop in at any second now. Okay, if I was to do autoregressive analysis here, I'd probably project that the expectation would be to go forward. But down here, I've got details about the strategies, the weightings on the strategies. 
Now, if I assume that people are kind of equal, or the machines are equally well dispersed on the strategies over the possible strategies, there's only a finite number of, of binary strategies, then I can build up from the previous time series a kind of weighting on the strategies. And it's almost like each one of these is like a coiled spring. And when the history, when the actual state of the game lands on that coiled spring, it kind of bounces and pushes it in one way or the other. And I notice down here on one of these coiled springs, it's looking a bit dark. And I know that if that history comes down here, this thing is just going to blow. So let's see what happens. Well, it's exactly what happens. The thing hits that, that orange um, um, marker, and the whole market just dies. And all I needed to know that that was going to happen was an assumption about machines being pretty much evenly distributed over some binary set of strategies, and then just building up that set of strategies over time. So as my last slide, I just want to show you where I think I, I, it's great that Jim you know, Hangers talked about soft control yesterday, because we've been trying to do the, exactly that same thing a few years ago, whereby you could try and, you're not just trying to manipulate the, where, the game, where the price is heading. You're probably, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to manipulate the whole probability distribution function because you know the mean you know, the things don't always follow the mean they can you know it's a distribution function so how can i manipulate the whole distribution function so that price was just one trajectory on the probability distribution function and it turns out we don't use we find that we don't you don't need to use shills you don't need to use special agents that have got some kind of uh, global information you just invite a few more people to join it's like having a party where you're worried about the balance and you think, well, I'll invite a couple of others. They don't know that they've been invited specially to kind of mix it up, and they haven't got any special properties. You just invite them to sit in certain holes in the strategy allocation, such that when things head off into that particular nasty zone, it, it kind of pulls itself back, and nobody ever knows, nobody's no, no, nobody is any the wiser. So that's the, that's the um, situation in which we are, and thank you for your um, patience. Um, it's been a kind of, it's, it's, um, I'm convinced that the, um, the way forward in complexity is to cross over these different topics with the same kind of model. I think Brian Arthur's model is absolutely superb for doing that. What's interesting is the way in which you interpret it and the way in which you um, implement it can also then give insight into mo what might be going on under the hood in these different systems. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, I, I know in the sense of which you use it, and uh, you know I haven't been talking about minority games just because I don't want to complicate the, the landscape. But in a set essence, it's just the same. It's just another implementation of the same, the same idea. And this competition, as you said, you know, and I absolutely agree. The, the adaptive nature, I don't think it applies. So, in, you know, I'm, I'm very wary about applying anything in physical systems because of the adaptive, the lack of adaptive nature. But anything else. I absolutely agree that, the, 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 that these, there's a couple of core models, and I think you can go a long way, like you can with a pen knife in some sense, in, in, in fixing a whole bunch of things around the house. And I, you know, they may not be perfect, but until some, but it, it's almost like a, it, it, but it's a unifying thread. And since you know, physics has never been, I always find it interesting with you know, 
But you know, physics has never been in the business as perfectly getting fits to superconductivity curves and this kind. That's not the business of physics. The business of physics is to more or less capture the behavior and then ask the question, what's the minimal model that I can capture this with? And is it the same minimal model as I've got in some other situation? Because if it is, that might be telling me that there's a core principle. So I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, so here's, here's a real result. This isn't just a um, schematic. This is re these are real runs of the, uh, the uh, generalization of the alpha role with variable numbers of players, like a pool, like a, like a grand canonical version. Um, but um, but th these, are, these are the probability distributions run forward, and these are the trajectories of the mean and the mean when you've added these red agents. And these red agents, if you pick carefully the strategies that they have, so if you invite the right people, you need very few. You can see here each of the blue blocks is, a, is an agent in the system that would produce the blue probability distributions. Notice none of these look like Gaussians. This isn't just some kind of diffusion problem into the future. They're very, very different. They've got tail events up here, you know, bimodal distributions. Um, but you have to add very few here. There's, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm sure that if I'd have chosen it more carefully, um, maybe I could get it down to you know a few. I don't have a science for that. It's something that worries me. I only do it. I can only do this by hand. Um, there must be a way that I can do this analytically. There is a big difference. These agents, these red ones here, aren't special in any sense. They, they could, in another random picking of a collection of agents with heterogeneous agents with different strategies, they, they would have appeared. It's just that in this particular setup, for this particular world, they're not there. And they need to be invited in, in order to keep this system off of its, um, to, to change its trajectory. So it's not a case that they're in any, they don't even know that they're different. <laughs> They're just, they're just part of the general, you know, richness of the population. Okay, I think maybe we'll stop at this point. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you.